bit and you'll probably just get what you just read. I'm Terry Lee Nielsen, and I grew up in this area. I grew up on the other side of Green Mountain, and I've lived, um, I've lived here um, in this very community for the last 22 years. My home is just up the hill. Um, and I was gone for three weeks traveling, so I missed a lot of this news. And I, somebody's going to have to dig in their purse for some Kleenex for me because I'm just, I'm floored. I'm upset, and you can include as the stakeholders the people who live here, who yes. bought their properties and their homes right here to live here. Thank you, thank you. Um, you can include the howdy sign in Golden that we pass through with our community, our culture, is we are the West, and Golden, as a lot of us know, was the first, uh, um, give me the word here, it was a state capital before Denver was. We have a history. I, I am going to cry, so I'm thank you for getting those Kleenex out. Um, I'm, I'm putting this akin to... Um, what went on down in Lodo when when Lodo had people laying in the streets and drinking alcohol and we had to pick it up and it was a big trash mess and a few people gathered from the community and said hey we're going to find some money to make this community down here in Lodo nicer now we've got a ball field down there if what we need to do is upgrade the asset we have here Jefferson County is a large county and there are a ton of stakeholders in Jeff Cohen a 1.8 million dollar deficit is a drop in the bucket for what this asset can be and what it could be. Uh, we also have some potential donors. We're lucky that the uh, Gates Family Foundation, that their Bill and Melinda Gates' oldest daughter is an equine person and she has just invested and bought her parents gave her for her college graduation a ranch that will raise horses and uh, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation invest in communities and schools and education programs. I think what we need is more awareness of what's needed and to make this asset a better asset that can be more usable. But the thought of it being eliminated or partially eliminated or reduced is, is my family has enjoyed all kinds of services here and I bought my property up the hill so there's, there's a ton of stakeholders that we're not including. Property value, property value, homeowners is certainly um, a large percentage of that business community needs to be on that board. It has a direct impact to this community out here in Deco. Um, that's been across Facebook across the weekend. Uh, so don't forget your Okay. All right. So what we have is uh, High School Rodeo, 4-H, Western Airs, Equine Club, <laughs> CSU Extension, Public Homeowners, uh, businesses. Marketing of Golden itself as the West. Yeah. I'm sorry? Marketing, marketing efforts that's been going on in Golden for 100 years. That's where the West is born and where the West is. The sign that's on Main Street in Golden. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Anybody who's had an animal evacuated during an emergency? Yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. We've yes. had thousands of animals. Okay. All right, what else? How about Sorry. baseball? How about open space? Open space as a, a stakeholder? Okay. Yep. As an asset. The history of this territory being Rooney's land and Foss Horse Ranch land. Um, and the last horse ranch that was just where Steve Landing was. And that's where I rented horses when I was a kid. So, you know, Crowder Stables. Okay, so uh, what I'm asking for, I appreciate it, ma'am, I do. Um, yeah, we've got a lot of that, those comments. Let's put that into words, because those are stakeholders. The cultural history, do you have the cultural history written down there? The cultural history is a huge stakeholder, just like Lodo, just like Lodo was before they refurbished it. They refurbished it mainly because it was Denver's cultural history. Okay, we got it. Okay. What else? Yes, ma'am. I, I, I don't know if anybody is here, but I'm a member of the Buffalo Bill Study Club. 
but just kind of that started up again. There are 73 members now. We would like to use the facility and all the tiles. We are a tile team, so we will only tile about you, the other tile about the tile is, is that an equine club? Yeah. What yeah, kind of club is it? Okay, so I got, I got that captured there. Okay. Sure. Sure. Does that, does that work? <laughs> is there a microphone they can use? I just was saying that I, we needed to we identify the individual clubs, Western Airs, 4-H, and so on. We need to take into account the, the people in the county that are horse people that are ag, in the ag business, that are in the ag hobbies, that come out here and participate and get the benefit from what goes on here um, so we don't lose them and because that's a big chunk. And, piece of, that you have to take into account. Uh, the Foothills Animal Shelter. Every time we come here for anything 4-H, there's always a ton of dogs getting walked here constantly. So uh, where animal shelter? Yeah. Yes, ma'am. That's a separate piece of property. That's not. But they're still they're still on here. They stay walking around constantly. Okay. 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 What else? argument that uh, tourism could suffer with the closing of the fairgrounds. Okay, I think as a Western Air, I performed for a number of tourist groups coming through for various shows, and that's money that they come, drop in our community, and then leave. Okay. Summer festivals. Well, one more in the back, all the way back there. There's lots of trail riders and people who don't have places to ride that come strictly because it's a place for them to ride. Okay. I think we got that. Thank you. And the Western Airs, <clears throat> pardon me, are really a signature of the area, and in a sense, sort of a satellite of the National Western. And when we consider the enormous amount of money being involved, being invested into the National Western, why not become not part of that, but it, 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 they certainly complement one another. Okay. You do, but you're talking this way, and I think there's folks all the way out in the hallway. So <laughs> the last, Sorry, last, Jill. The meeting last time represented 8% of the equine was 8% was a user year of 8%. How much of that do you incorporate Western Airs to be? Is that the full 8%? Does Jeffco High School rodeo team represent? You know, of those stakeholders, what is the 8% for open counties? No, so if I was to look at $1.8 million in terms of the cost of operating the fairgrounds, the, the agony equine portion costs about $180,000, $200,000. So the rest of it, Western Airs does not, uh, Western Airs is uh, self-functioning. They uh, get everything done that they need to get done through their volunteer network and through their organization. Is that correct, sir? Okay. So the other stakeholders need to represent 8% yes. needs to represent a solution to that other $200,000. We need to be a solution and not a deficit to that, to 
Yeah, I think we can get there. I guess, I guess, you know, what I'm getting to is that, you know, we've got to, we've got to make cuts, we've got to make uh, reductions, but I want to make sure that we preserve what's most important for the community. That none of these choices are easy. Again, you know, a lot of the folks that you're talking about, we went to the ballot. They spoke to us. So the entirety of the county had an opportunity to make an impact on it. Now we've got to circle back and and look for those places where. Um, but quite frankly, that um, you know, those things that only government can do. I think, um, in terms of Jefferson County, um, there you, you heard loud and clear, like Caden was saying, if we don't ride here, how far do we have to go? We got to go to Boulder. We have to go to Adams. We have to go. There's not a, there's not the same type of riding capabilities everywhere. So that's not easily replaced. I, I totally understand that. So we're trying to identify those things that absolutely are not easily replaced. So. Sir? What are the big items that make up the 1.6? 200,000 is equine horse. It's the operations, the rest of the fairground to support other events, um, uh, WWE, UFC fights, uh, all the different events that are different events that happen. Um, in previous years, it was the fair. We weren't, we weren't planning on doing the fair this year. Um, so there's those other expenses, and then there's ground uh, upkeep. You know, we got to keep the grass cut. We've got to. Um, we've got about 10 employees that, that help run and maintain the fairgrounds and run the events. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I mean, if, if it's an event that, that generates revenue, I would expect that to remain at least break even if not the county. Exactly. Um, if you, um, if, so the revenue that is generated out of the fairgrounds is about 500000 so there's a currently some sort of somewhere around 27%, 28% cost recovery. Uh, through some changes, we think we could get that up to 57. That was part of what we looked at is could we get to an enterprise. We can't get there. The comments from last time were um, in a lot of cases, there's not a fairgrounds across the country that makes money um, or even breaks even. I don't disagree with that. Um, uh, organizations, they, they fund with general fund dollars. Um, they put forward towards those uh, those organizations. Um, if uh, for those of you that were here last time, it's part of a budget drill. When you look at revenue uh, that counts against Tabor restrictions, it's not necessary. Making the revenue doesn't really pay the bill because that revenue counts against a, a limit for the county. Uh, those funds could be used elsewhere. So even though there's revenue coming in here, that revenue is, can be made up in other parts of the county and can be spent on things like the jail. Um, as you know, the sheriff has been um, setting prisoners free because he closed a floor of the jail to meet some of the budget cuts. Uh, we're looking at everything from closing a floor to the jail to the fairground operations. None of these decisions or conversations are easy. That's why I'm here. That's why we want to talk about this to get a better understanding of where we need to go and where we can go to preserve what's important. But there's, everybody's going to feel part of this. It's just a reality. Yes, ma'am. My dad is a businessman, and my sister is in business school, and they have a saying that your lack of planning does not constitute an emergency on my part. And this didn't just all of a sudden happen. Right. So it strikes me that perhaps our leadership is not planning well. And when my husband lost his job, I am plug the extra refrigerator and cancel subscriptions. I didn't wait till I was out of my so some of I'm, for all due respect, Don, your words are a little empty to me in the sense that we've got to buck up because um, maybe we need to fire some employees. Let go. I, I don't want people to fire, but I'm, it's not my responsibility to have a job creation plan. So um, I don't think there's complete transparency from our county. Um, to answer your question in terms of FTEs, to make the cuts that we're talking about, we're talking probably somewhere in the neighborhood of 150 FTEs that will need to be eliminated in order to get to that number, which includes people that work out here at the fairgrounds um, and that work across the whole of government. Uh, so we're looking at everything. Yeah, I, I guess my concern is you keep mentioning that the voters voted to, uh, to make these cuts across the county. Um, and, and I think it, there, there's a different idea. I don't believe that the voters voted to make cuts in the county. I think they voted 
make the government responsible for the budget that they have. And hasn't been used properly. Um, and, and I think that's a huge problem. Um, and from, I can tell you this, from, uh, from looking at the fairgrounds budget as, as we were charged to find a 7% cut, it became very clear that there was money in the budget that we identified that and recommended that the, the commissioners cut um, that is still in the budget today, and instead they chose to cut the fair and festival, but they still haven't cut that budget. And, and I guess one question I would have, um, and, and maybe you can answer this, and maybe you can't, but um, the um, the commissioners when they had us look at that budget um, and to recommend cuts. Um, they told us that all of the employees were off limits. We couldn't look at cutting set, uh, in, in employees. Um, and so um, now that the fair and festival is gone and, all, and half of those employees were hired to put on the fair and festival, why do we still have all the same employees um, that we aren't using for the fair and festival? Yeah. Three options are status quo, a state enterprise, and elimination of the fairgrounds. But I think there should be a fourth option, and that's looking at the budget again and giving this a fair shot, because I don't even think there's really the option of giving this a, a fair shot with a leaner budget, which the advisory committee has tried to do. Like Mark mentioned last week, there was some capital improvements that we said this should be taken out. With the landscaping, there was some things that we felt could be trimmed back a bit. And so I feel like that is a great option where we can keep the fairgrounds going just with a responsible budget. That should be option number four. So um, we're here to talk about option four. I don't disagree um, that the three options that were previously mentioned didn't start the conversation, like I said last week. And so working with this, the budget's not final in top October. Um, but we need to make some decisions early on in order to um, uh, allow uh, people to find jobs elsewhere and to do other types of things. So uh, we're trying to get some direction early on in the year so that 21 doesn't just roll up on us and, and we don't have those decisions ready. Um, so I, I would, I would uh, ma'am, I think... Did you state your question again? My question is, who, who is this? The budget we're talking about, who is the pay for? Is it pay for the forage system? Is that on the issue? It pays for the operations out here at the fairgrounds. Uh, CSU extension, uh, there's some money that we do provide some general fund augmentation. There are some CSU dollars that come through the CSU system. So let me, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask that we, I, I want to move to the next piece and talk about some possible solutions. Okay. Um, okay, so what are the business units? Dexter, where are you at? Okay, so uh, what are some of the uh, line items in your budget? You've got salaries, so it's a pay employees. Um, you've got so supplies, okay. Services and charges. Interdepartmental for like when we do facilities and things like that. Okay, so those are the categories. The tenants that are here are CSU extension, um, which is all includes 4-H. Um, the other tenants that we have are uh, Western Airs, but that's more part. They they're kind of on their own piece of property. Right. Except for what we rent here, what we rent. Right. We do that a lot. Does that answer your question, ma'am? Yes. So, 
enterprise is a viable option to me in the fact that you could leverage finding money, if you would. You could borrow money as an enterprise fund, could you not? You have to prove that you are you can be an enterprise and survive off of less than 10% government funds for a period of five years. Okay. So we'd have to present a business plan that would include that type of, of, of evidence, according to the state in terms of that person. So with that, you need to attract or at least expand 8% and 16% in my mind, and, or 20% of the smaller equine community. And to me, the reason that you're not is it's not attractive. So if you pose to a nonprofit such as myself, the cost to do business relative to other municipalities, 1,200 is attractive. So I did a study for an outside facility that attracts me to 2,500 over 10,000. Does that make sense where I'm going? So I can't ask this percentage of equine to raise unless your price point comes down. So I challenge you to ask where the value of this side of the complex is. It's too variable. It, it, it may be 20,000 one day. It could be less a different day. And yes, I understand the discount. I get that. But it's not attractive to outside communities to come here and participate. So, Jill, to be clear, you're talking about just enterprising the ag and equine piece? I'm at least enterprising, leveraging the funds to sustain for 2020. Right, but when you talk about yes. generating 90 per, it's just for that ag and equine piece. So, in terms of, you're not looking to enterprise the entire fairgrounds, it's just the piece that that is important to your group and to the folks that are, are, that are part of your group, right? Correct. Correct, only because that's what I'm... Sure. No, I get that. Yeah, and that's what you're here for. I mean, you're here for Caden. I don't. You, that's exactly what you're here for. Don, I'd like to propose a plan, like five, I guess. Are we on five now? Um, possible <laughs> solution. Um, yeah, possible solution five. Um, and I have a few questions for you. Okay. Um, so the fairgrounds is an open space site, correct? Um, the fairgrounds is not an open space. But it's owned by open space, right? No, it's owned by the general fund. So it's owned by the general fund. So There's a portion of uh, Western Air's property that includes the pastures. It's the easements that and is stuff. Open space. Yeah. So what would it take? And this is just like throwing stuff out there, okay? What would it take to take the fairgrounds and put it in open space? And I know that the open space does all sorts of land swaps, all sorts of stuff like that. So that would take the fairgrounds out of general fund and put it into open space. And then we take a model like Dinosaur Ridge that's run by a Friends of Dinosaur Ridge Foundation. And we create a Friends of the fairgrounds, although I think we could be more original. But, um, <laughs> and we create a foundation to run it. And I know that a lot of talk in the past couple of weeks has been about, or in the past week, has been about um, having sponsorships, raising rates, having bringing things in like the Festival of the West, that kind of stuff. And I understand that with Tabor, we're limited in revenue and we're limited in a lot of things. But if we take it out of the general fund and put it in open space and create this foundation that's a 501c3, it's no longer it no longer has limitations of the paper. Am I right? You are correct, Lisa. Um, so what I hear you saying, okay. so what I hear you saying, to the extent that we can operate underneath the Open Space Charter, uh, which Tom and Steve are here um, from Open Space that can uh, speak to that. You want to add some more? I did a little homework because, you know, I like to be a good example for our youth. Um, so when you look at the open space, and I'm going to get it wrong, but it's the something something acquisition something. Uh, <laughs> stick with me. <laughs> and it's like a charter that they look at. They put every 
property, I'm assuming. And I'm just getting this from what's online. Um, they put everything through this acquisition list. And some of the things that they talk about are things like cultural um, interest, cultural heritage, which is what we're all about here. When you look on our list of stakeholders, it's cultural history. When you look at open space, I, I have to say, um, I don't ride a horse, but my daughter does nonstop. And there's nothing more open space than riding a horse. And so um, when you look at the ag and the livestock, and you look at master gardeners and their garden, that's all open space. And so it fits very, very well with all of that. They have a whole section on education that it fits with. And so I think that when you look at creating this fund and moving it into open space, it totally aligns with what they want to do. And so I think that, um, is there a way to do that? What would it take to okay, do that? So you had me at hello. Oh, hello. <laughs> I don't. I, I think this is a very viable solution in terms of um, open space partnership and looking at those things that you tie directly to the charter. And so I, I think, um, you know, that's again part of this meeting tonight is kind of hear some of those ideas to have open space here uh, to consider that as an option. Um, and then I think that goes back to some other questions. Do you want this one that's on? Yeah, I probably want that one. I'll swap. Do you want this one? All right. We'll just keep talking. All right, she's got the lower one. Um, so uh, I think open space, I think this is a very viable uh, possibility. I, I think that this has a lot of promise. Um, that's why I wanted to identify what the stakeholders were and what those are. Because if we're going to have some sort of, as you know, for those of you who know, that open space doesn't run parks and rec or those types of activities. It's a nonprofit or it's a, um, a, a parks and rec department for a municipality. Those are the organizations. So open space has historically uh, come in, uh, acquired some property, and then turned it over for the use of open space related activities. There's usually a reverter clause in there. There's a contract or some sort of agreement between open space and and the provider. It's kind of why I wanted to get after what the student stakeholders are and what we're going to do, because if we do this open space solution, what I think is a good idea, who's it with and how do we get to where we're meeting the needs of the community and still falling underneath the charter? Well, and I think that if you look at open space and you look at, and not just open space, but if you look at um, having a foundation and having it be a 501c3, then you have all of those stakeholders at the table, and you have everyone have a voice. <laughs> and so it doesn't become, I mean, like you said last week, this general fund has to do what only government can do. And I think that a foundation can run this. And from what everyone's saying, and I don't know, because I don't know the fairgrounds budget, I'm not a numbers person. Um, but maybe they can do it better. Agreed. Okay, so by the applause, yes ma'am? Oh, I was just going to ask a question to understand how it works when you were explaining open space acquires the land, but then it doesn't continue to manage it, and then it turns over to a foundation or, or some sort of 501c3, but there are restrictions on how that can be used. Is there still some sort of... Well, there's a charter for open space. Like, they can't buy open space and turn it over to an organization and they decide to put a, um, a store there right. or do something. It has to be something that falls within their original charter because that money, that voter-approved budget and that voter-approved tax was for a very specific purpose. So legally, we have requirements to meet that charter. So, and I do think that the operation especially when you look at the equine and ag operations and, and that type of stuff, that very much falls within parks and rec type activities. It's a, you know, riding a horse is a recreational activity no more than playing soccer or hitting a softball or doing anything else. Caden was fourth in the state last year. All right, Caden? All right, see, so, yeah, a round of applause for Caden. Uh, so I think that that's, um, you know, I mean, I think that that fits within the charter. Um, and it looks like Tom's coming up. He's ready to... No, you're not ready? Okay. <laughs> um, darn, I thought I could hand the microphone off. Um, so, 
by the applause, it sounds like people think that that's a, that's a, a good idea mm -hmm. and that helps preserve what you're interested in, right? Yeah. Okay, yeah. sir? You want a microphone? No, I okay. can speak loud enough. Years ago, Western, Air, I mean not Western, Air, Jefferson County Fairgrounds was booked. I remember I, I worked with Fletcher Wood and Mary can even contest that every one of these, the auditorium was booked, everything was booked. We had Little Bridges Rodeo. We had uh, professional ro uh, rodeos here. We had uh, everybody, I mean, this place was just booked and booked and booked and booked and booked. What happened to the marketing? We have no marketing. <laughs> these businesses in Jefferson County, we need somebody. Oh, you know, I can understand about the price and all that. Well, how about let's lower it to generate the business to bring it back? Because we lost so much business. And that's a good question. It's one of the things, and you look nationwide, fairgrounds across the country are having a similar. What we're experiencing here is not unusual. Um, so we're working, we've been working hard. They've been working on scheduling shows and, and trying to cut deals. It doesn't matter. It could be a rodeo. It could be a circus. It could be any one of the things, getting folks to come in and use the venue because it's available. So it, that, that is being worked. Um, just the bottom line is, is that nationwide we're seeing some of the same trends in other fairgrounds. Well, actually, my understanding as an outside public is very hard to get in. Okay. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> okay. I also did some research into open space as a viable option for the fairgrounds. Yes, Mm -hmm. And what I'm curious about is these events, like this gentleman was talking about, and other events, would those still be allowed in this facility as part of the charter under open space? Would we still be allowed to bring in, like, for example, the library book sale, which is really important to our community? And, um, just other, you know, craft fairs and things like that. Is that allowable under the open space charter? Um, looking at Tom, it, it, I, I think that would probably be acceptable. Those details, if 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 the oh, so um, if it's not parks or right, library because we do have a library, so maybe there's some library piece to that because um, it's not a catch-all. But open space as a viable part of this solution in terms of coming in to preserve some property to make sure that we maintain the ag and equine operations and those other things that we feel that are of greater need. That is a viable solution. Correct, Tom? Okay. Rodeo? Yeah. I would say that the solution, though, was not just the open space. It also involved a component of a foundation administering the program to ease the burden of government and manage the budget. And Agreed. And that, that would have to, that, if, if open space ends up being that solution, that's the only way it works, is that there's some entity willing to take that lead. Is it a foundation that's newly formed that's, that, that may be a little bit harder to do? Maybe that's a longer term after something forms. Is it CSU Extension? Is it Western Airs? Is it fill in the blank? Is it the high school rodeo club? Or, or is it, you know, I mean, there's like Dinosaur Friends of Dinosaur Ridge, that's a foundation. We have an agreement with them. In a lot of cases, it might be Golden Parks and Rec or Lakewood Parks and Rec. So there's, there's some entity that is capable and they've shown that capability and they can sign an agreement that we can, that, that gets us what we need. Um, I don't think open space would turn any property over without that type of assurance that the property is going to be used for what it's intended. And if it wasn't, um, I think every agreement we have has some sort of reverter clause that it goes back to the county. So, just because I have the money. <laughs> yes, you do. <laughs> just to, um, like, what you're saying is this entity, would we have time to create this foundation and present it to whoever we need to present it to as a viable thing? So if we wanted to get the people in this room together, create the foundation, create a 501c3, present it to whoever we need to present it to, to take on this kind of a challenge, would we have that kind of time to do that before October? 
Wow. I, so I think it would be hard before October, but I think if this was the direction that we were to, uh, agreed to go into, or this is the direction we went in, we put some sort of stop measures in place to allow for that to mature and to happen the way that it would need to happen. So the county, the powers of the or whoever, would be willing to work with us and sit down at the table with us and come up with some kind of um, Yeah, the county, that's why I'm here, is yeah. that I'm here to work with you guys <laughs> and come up with an answer that get the, gets the board and the county where they need to be, but also helps make sure that everybody in this room is getting their services. So we could work towards that end. I think that that's very viable, especially with this particular area. Okay, so. I, I may have missed something. Are you discussing only the agricultural and equine portion of the fairgrounds or the whole fairgrounds being part of open space? Well, in my mind, I think you look at, and I have a strange mind, so excuse me, but in my mind, you look at the fairgrounds, and there are three categories. And you look at it, and you have the where we are now, the convention exhibit area, um, which is very important for H and CSU extension. We use these rooms a lot. You have the ag equine kind of zone from the rodeo arena all the way down to table view. Um, and then you have the RV park. And the RV park is something that nobody's kind of addressing. But I think that the RV park also falls into an open space category because when you look at White Ranch, you look at all of these. I don't know if Golden Gate is an open space. Is Golden Gate open space? I, you know, we have a lot of campgrounds that open space has. It's recreational. And so it also falls under. So for me, it encompasses everything. You know, I think it encompasses it all. Okay. That's just all right. Let me get some folks that haven't spoken, sir. Has there been any sort of a market study done on the various things that would affect the uses that you're trying to protect? Any kind of a market study? Um, that that topic came up. Um, Cheyenne, uh, who is a member of the Fairgrounds Advisory Committee, she was going to go back to the Economic Development Corporation and uh, look to get an economic impact study done on the fairgrounds. And then a follow-up, is there any underutilization of the space that's here? <laughs> that's why we're here. That, that would be an understatement. Well, we tell me that, that the, this is going to be a drain to the county from here on out. All the uses that we've got there, and they're worthwhile. I mean, they help people. So what we've got to do is look at it in terms of something to offset that loss. And what sort of uses would that be? That's where I'm coming from, very simplistically. Okay, thank you. Um, I have a question. Ahead. Are there any other county fairgrounds, Boulder, Douglas, anything that run under the open space charter? Um, yes. Okay. Yes. yes. So there's already no. residents at the. What's that? No. Yeah, yeah, no, I will. I will. Okay. So yes, ma'am. Just to clarify, kind of going on what she said. Do those fairgrounds allow events that are for profit, like a rodeo that's for profit, or um, fairs that would make money? Is it only nonprofits that can use that space? No. So Tom says no, not if it's for profit. I mean, I think like um, Boulder has a, a, a nonprofit organization that comes in and runs the fair, right? So they run that separately. It's not provided by from funds from open space, it's run by a separate organization and they incur the liability and the responsibility for running that event. Okay. No ma'am, we, 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 we got to give other people a chance to talk. Sir. I have a question. Sir. Get you. Yes, yeah, sir. I have a question about other nonprofits. Could they use that as open space? Say like the American Legion or some other that are that would help with you know, adding funds and grants and stuff? What's Say, that? like, healing waters or... Um, okay, so let me put Tom over here and he'll, give, he'll talk to you a little bit about open space and what we can do. So, thank you all for coming out tonight. I'm Tom Hovey. I'm the director of Jeffco Open Space. Up until a couple of years ago, I had the fairgrounds as part of my purview, including CSU Extension and Betcher Manson. So, I know a little bit about the fair, fairgrounds. Hi, guys. Good to see you. Um, 
So a uh, couple things about the open space fund. First of all, it was, it was created by voters in 1972 as a half cent sales tax. Um, so the foundational document that we always refer to, we've been using the word charter, we call it our enabling resolution. It's the resolution that the commissioners adopted in 1972 that established the open space fund, ratified what voters had voted on uh, November 7th, 1972. So that's on our website. You can click on it. You can read through the whole resolution. Um, and it's right out there for you to look at. So there's a couple of pieces here. So we have to make sure that we're expending open space funds for park and, and open space purposes. And that's pretty clear in the enabling resolution. Um, so what's clear to me uh, as we look at this is that there's two pieces that of, of major pieces of business get that, that get done here at the fairgrounds. There's events, the ones that Don cited earlier, and then there's the ag and equine activities. The event side will not pass muster with the enabling resolution. Unfortunately, that's where all the revenue comes from to run this facility. The, the ag and equine stuff will, we think, could fit into the enabling resolution. Let me tell you another thing about open space. We're very building averse. Buildings cost a lot of money to run. So I was just looking at the fairgrounds budget, and ma'am, you can find that on the county website and see all those expenditures. So $525,000 of the fairgrounds budget is in interdepartmental expenses. That's largely to operate buildings that are on the site. And that's one of the concerns that we have at Open Space when we acquire any property. In fact, we're just looking at a piece of land where we're specifically said, if we buy this property, we're going to carve out this house and we're going to sell it. Because that's generally a liability for us. So there is a way through this, but there's some nuts and bolts things that we need to work through. And that might mean saying, what? are the ag and important ag and equine facilities here at the fairgrounds that you all really need and want and how can we do that in the most efficient way so we have high utilization thank you for that question sir it was very spot on because the utilization of some of these facilities is quite low so we really need to look at this from a business perspective and say what makes sense to keep how can we make these facilities multi-use in order to have these ag and equine activities that's how it could fit into the open space fund and and the comments that were made earlier that the open space fund is the bruce meaning it's, it doesn't it isn't subject to the same uh, revenue limits that the general fund is that was done back in 1998 along with the bond election uh, to buy open space lands so i just wanted to give that little bit of background because we're kind of bouncing around there are fairgrounds, as Don mentioned earlier, there are fairgrounds out there that are partially funded with open space funds. So one of those would be Boulder County. There's also general fund money. So what that allows them to do is to host events that might be outside of the scope of their open space, um, their version of whatever their enabling resolution is called. Um, Charter. I'm not sure exactly what Boulder County calls it. I'm guessing it's a resolution as well. So I hope that helps in terms of a little bit of background. So, so to be clear, Tom, that each, not every open space, not all open spaces are equal. It depends on what they're enabling directive. So you're speaking specifically to yours. Yeah, so I'm spe specifically speaking to the ballot language and the following enabling resolution that Jefferson County voters passed. Um, so I just want to mention one other thing. There was some mention of Dinosaur Ridge, and uh, and we and we have another partnership with a nonprofit at Beaver Ranch. Um, Dinosaur Ridge uh, is a nonprofit that's operated for a while, and they what helps them be successful is they get SCFD or um, Scientific and Cultural Facilities District funding. So that gives them some base funding to operate off of, and then they have some fees and charges for their tours and various things. So that's a piece that really helps. Conversely, at Beaver Ranch, up until recently, they didn't have any base source of funding. 
and that was really tough sledding for them to make ends meet. Okay. All right, so open space as a solution. Okay, it seems like, um, yes, ma'am? Yes, are, are we just kicking the can further down the street with the open space solution? I'm not familiar with that one. Okay. Uh, the charter or the legislation. But it seems to me it's it's not a permanent solution. It's just kind of kicking the can down the street so that we're going to be facing this again, possibly in a few years. I, I don't I don't know, ma'am. I think I think it actually could be an enduring solution because you purchase the property, it stays underneath open space. The open space property that we have bought in the past, that we have partnerships with those park and recs or those organizations. They still exist today. There's, we don't have any examples of where, I mean, I don't know of any that have folded. Or do you have any, Tom? It could, it could be a long-term solution. I mean, it, 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 but you could be right as well. I mean, the, the devil's in the details, right? We need to right. figure out figure out all those kind of things. Okay. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. If, if open space is only able to acquire a portion of the actual fairgrounds property, or you're saying you're building a verse, you want to consolidate or assess the buildings on the property, what happens to the stuff that doesn't fit in, under your umbrella? You know, you said like you had property that had a house on it, you wanted, you decided to sell it. So what happens with the rest of the the space? I, I think that goes back to Tom's comment about the devil's in the details. If this is the direction we move, then that's what we start talking about. We do have to look at the fairgrounds and say, what is important? What is what it means successful? What portions of the fairgrounds are absolutely necessary? And if we're going to say all of it, then we're still at square one. If we're going to say these things are the most important and then prioritize as we go through, then that's where we get to where things that are most important, we want to make sure we preserve those. And then we've got to talk about those other areas that may not be quite as important or that, to Tom's point, um, that um, there, the expenses there. You know, I think uh, in terms of, uh, Caden, I think you would say, that, what would you say is the most important building for you? Well, to our club at least, it's the indoor arena, but I can recognize that it'd be different for all the other associations I can't speak with. Right, but for you, it's the arena, right? Yeah. Right, so that's the ability to train year-round uh, weather dependent, you, you guys can do that. That's something, and that's a that's pretty much like a pole barn. So uh, that doesn't have a whole lot of overhead in it. That's something that um, I think is. It, it seems like that can be. Those are the types of things can be worked out. Okay. Would you have? Did you want to say something? Yeah. Um, so. Yeah. Yeah. The left one. No. All right, thank you, sir. So, um, Tom, Tom, um, so if I hear you right, um, the open space solution would encompass probably the upper level of the fairgrounds without the buildings down below because you don't want to have buildings involved. Um, and I know in the past um, we've spoken under open space and the fairgrounds as far as possibly moving the fairgrounds um, in its entirety to other locations um, and um, and it, so it, it, if it just encompassed the upper level that would I would imagine then that you would probably uh, recommend selling the lower level and I know at one time you were looking at doing that to build uh, another facility would, would the rest of the fairgrounds go out to a different facilities and you leave the fairgrounds here to stand on its own Good now. Yeah. Um, so uh, thanks, thanks, Mark. Um, so the uh, what you no, it's not working. <laughs> thanks, Mark. Um, so a couple things. Uh, the upper level is uh, that you mentioned is much more straightforward in terms of the open space fund for the reasons that you mentioned, Mark. Um, uh, I want to shine the light on these facilities down here are owned by the general fund, not by the open space fund. So it would be the general fund's pleasure uh, on what they would do with these buildings. Um, so, but it is, it, these, these buildings at the lower level would be cause for concern for the open space fund because 
they cost a lot of money to operate, and they would cost a lot of money to upgrade, um, especially if you want to continue to use them for events, because if you're going to be competitive in the marketplace, there's probably some upgrades that need to be done. Some of them are aesthetic, some of them are functional, some of them are technological. Um, and, and also, those events, most of them that occur, that bring in revenue, um, would not fit the enabling resolution of the open space fund. Okay. Yes, ma'am. So, and what is, am I hearing that if we went open space, that the land would go, but 4-H and CSU in the buildings would not go with it? I, it's, so if, if open space was to purchase property, it, it, again, I think the, de the, the devil would be in the details. Nobody, CSU is not going anywhere. CSU extension exists for a very big reason, um, and 4-H is not going anywhere. Um, where they meet, if they meet in this room or a room somewhere else, I mean, that, that is something we can, there's rooms within our county uh, facilities to provide that. Um, if, the, if the buildings here get repurposed, or if the board decided to sell it, um, I don't. Like I think I told you that last time that that's not what we're talking about, and that's not that's, that's not something that I'm recommending at this at this time because I think there's other um, there would be other things that we would need to do before we sold an asset of the county uh, to something else, and when we still have problems and challenges inside the county, um, we've done we did a facilities master plan over the next 20 years with the goal of accomplishing, we, we suspect that the county, if the county continues to grow the next 20 years, like it's grown in the previous 20 years, the government's gonna look different. It's gonna be bigger, the jail will have to be bigger. There's a lot of different things that, would, that will need to be here in 20 years. Um, the study that we did was to try to come up with a way that does not expand our footprint, but that we can get the business of the county 20 years from now done with the same footprint that we have now. And we're trying to do that so that we don't increase our infrastructure requirements and so forth. So we've been working really hard with doing that. But that also means that we've got to maximize every piece of property that we have to do all those things that we do. So you're saying that 4-H and CSU extension would remain, but not necessarily here? That, that could be that could be the solution, or it could be that they do stay here. Okay, um, let me let this young lady who hasn't asked a question. Yet. Okay, so he Tom was talking about how Boulder County is a general fund and an open space. How is there like they both have equal parts or something? How does that happen so that then we can still be keeping these buildings? Because I've been to Boulder County, and they have up top, they have their whole horses and everything like that. But then they also have their big, huge buildings as well. So how do they become general general funding and open space as well? How does how do they balance both those? I don't know if you want to answer. I take a shot at it, Tom, and then you uh, augment. Go ahead. Sure, I, and I'd be happy to dig into this deeper with my peer Eric Lane up in Boulder County. Um, uh, what what they've done is they've identified things that fit into. Allowed uses for their open space sales tax funding, and then they've said the non the non allowed uses the commissioners in Boulder County have said we're going to fund those with general fund dollars. Now, what specifically those look like, I'd have to talk to Eric a little bit and get a little more detail on that. Yeah, and and I mean, um, Boulder has a different tax base. They've got a different. That's a different community than Jefferson County. So. <laughs> Their availability and their um, willingness to use general funds to spread everywhere. Um, they, with, with what their situation is, that we're, we're just not Boulder County, we're Jefferson County. So they've got a different model in terms of funding and so forth and a different pot of money. Mm -hmm. I, I know so, that it's not easily explained, but mm -hmm. yes, ma'am. Just some other things that haven't been looked at or could be an itemized ballot issue specifically for Jefferson County Fairgrounds or getting grants or partnerships that hasn't been addressed yet yeah no and i think the open space when we talk about a partnership with a nonprofit or a foundation <laughs> that's exactly it that's a that's a that's part of that solution is it how do we get that partnership for an organization that's going to run it 
You said partnership. What was the other thing that you said, ma'am? Um, uh, itemized ballot issue or also grants. Right, there you go. But I, but I also thought about partnerships with corporations for um, the facilities that open space is not that interested in handling. So I think an itemized ballot is uh, definitely something, um, but you got to be prepared to for both answers, right? So that's what happens. That's what you see down in El Paso County and Colorado Springs. They they do a lot of item, and when the voters say no, that's the answer is no. So I I would I I think I would be that that is definitely an option, but you got to be ready for both answers. And I don't I personally think if we can come up with an answer that gets us there without doing that. It protects because there's a lot. We're in an urban county. You're, you're right. This is our character, and I think in it. But as the city expands, as Denver expands, I, I think you're losing some. I think one of the uh, one of the parents Seth, talked about they want their kids to be plugged into the outdoors, not into a machine, right? right. But most of us don't, and we see our kids are glued to those things, and it's changing. It's changing the discussion. And so we do want to preserve something like this. I just don't know if the other. If there's 51% of the people that actually see it that way, or that would see it a different way, so that's you just got to be careful about that that question. Yes, ma'am. Um, so out of the 100 acres that uh, comprises Jeffco Fairgrounds, how many acres would be subject to the uh, open space? Uh, that that would be in the details. I think that part of that is identifying from you all well, what is needed. Are there any kind of requirements that can limit? Well, that, that's so, ma'am. I that's what I want. You know, that, that's a good segue to our next question. What portions of the fairground do we need to be successful? All of them. What are those things? Okay, all of it. Don, I have a question. Okay, let me ask, let me get someone else who has it. Sir, I think you've got a chance. Let me keep playing the okay. I, I want to go back to what you said a few minutes ago about how uh, CSU extension they could maybe use uh, open space to somewhere else. I think a big part of extension is also the demonstration violence, which is kind of hard. County botanic garden, and there is a lot less mobile than a desk and a person at home. So I think that is uh, something you should also take into consideration, especially with uh, emphasis lately on having people, uh, you know, do things with urban farming, have uh, cityscape yards to reduce water use. I think those are all important things that, as a county, you're also looking at. Uh, so I think it's important to not uh, lose that part in this whole endeavor. Okay. Are you saying to keep the strength of the CSU extension connection here, keep that as a strength? I, I think so. Or at least it's, it's not your CSU is not your office. I guess that's I think we'd be crazy to bring our partnerships and CSU extension. Yeah, they will continue to operate within open space. But that, that's not, I don't see that changing. I just don't see that changing. Sure. So, a big part, you know, I'm here on a sled pulling association. You know, we pull at Adams County Fair, we bring in over a half a million dollars in one night and take a sale. So I think we're kind of forgetting the enterprise side of things. I may be the only one here, but I believe that's not true because there's other business owners here that run functions. I work up <coughs> the street and own a business. We utilize the fairgrounds they're used to in the way of their truck broke down, their traveling group, maybe with livestock or a travel trailer. We used to get them set up at the uh, campground, okay, which helped fund more taxes, more business, and still people camped here. Um, but a lot of the things like you talk about, like Adams County Fair or Fuller County Fair, like these big fairs and things, or Bingo or WWF, these are all enterprises that self-sustain themselves. You know, I kind of look at the Westerners. You know, and I'm for the horse thing, and I'm not here to turn this into motorcycle complex. <coughs> I sponsor the Jet Pro Rodeo team. My wife uses the, the open ride. My mother here is president of the Draft Horse Association, so very involved in all of this agriculture and this and that. But we look at the Westerners, they have a good lease going on up there, they built their own building, they support themselves, the rodeo team supports themselves, that's all on enterprise. So if we want to sustain ourselves, we have to come up with ways to support ourselves and not ask for the people in the way of change where he's talking about people plugged in. We're trying to preserve a way of life, 
but we're being outnumbered very quickly by the people that are plugged in that don't care about this. So if we want to keep this, we need to have our own ideas on some of the enterprise and quit asking for other people that don't care about this to support this. It's true. Thanks, Don. Um, I think it boils down to what do our elected officials plan on doing. I think this fairgrounds has been an asset of the county for what, 50, 60, 70 years? And I've been able to be involved in it for probably the last 20 years. And we've talked about cost recovery and we've talked about all these things and the changing demographics of the users and stuff like that. And I think what you're hearing is that it's a very important asset to a big part of the county and to our history and our heritage and things like that. I think it's a little unfair to just look at it as an all or nothing deal. I mean, you're trying to cut $16.1 million, right? Okay, 12 and a half. So this is even better. And you're asking us if it if ceases, ceases operations, 1.8, you're going to say. So that's about 15% of your deficit that the county's going to take, uh, that the fairground's going to take care of. Now, if you look at the 1.8 as a percentage of the overall county general fund budget, and you probably know what that is better than I am, better, better than I do, about, about 300 million, something like that. Yeah, it's about 3%. So you're asking us to have 3%. We're, yeah, we're, we're taking care of 12% or 15% of the deficit, and we're only responsible for 3% or 2% of the, the cost and things like that. I think that we possibly can look at solutions that would in, include us taking care of our pro rata share of that, to help the county uh, with their situation and what happened in the election and stuff like that. But it's not an all or nothing deal. I mean, there's a lot of reasons for this uh, and a lot of good that comes out of this. And I think that, I mean, I really think that it boils down. I, I appreciate what staff's doing, what we've had to do and things like that. There have been a lot of changes, but I think it really boils down to is do we want to use, continue to use, take care of, and be the best stewards that we can with this asset, or not. That's really what it boils down to. So, um, the total general fund budget is about $215 million. Um, this between the sheriff and DA, they spent about 150 of that. So if you do pro rata share, the sheriff's department will have to cut another four or five million dollars, and he, at three point two, he's had to shut a floor down to the jail. So I don't dis. I, I, that's what I tried last year. I tried a seven percent across the board cut. Um, that ran into some huge problems. They ran it to include the sheriff's um, pro rata of uh, uh, his fair share going from seven percent down to three and a half percent, with the understanding that. If the budget, if the ballot initiative did not go through, the rest of that would have to come through in the following year, plus whatever other adjustments they do. The problem that I'm up against is that there's not a, there's not equal spending of the of, of the general fund. So to do what you're saying, I, I'm I'm up for that. I'm a, if y'all want to email the sheriff and the DA and and tell them to um, take that four or five million dollars and and they got to figure it out. They're trying to figure it out right now. So I, I'm. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm not here to come and cut your program. I'm here to come up with some viable answers that get us to where we need to be. I, I'm, I mean, right, wrong, or indifferent. I mean, I, I, I appreciate the ladies' comments about, um, you know, the government and the, the of, uh, you know, the misuse of funds. I appreciate that. Um, I, I, I get that. I, I get that we get broad brushed into what's going on at the national level. The men and women that work at the county, they're working their butts off. The 10 people that work here at the county bust their butts every day for each one of you. They do. Yeah, you're around the clock. And guess 
what we're talking about they may not have a job in 2021 and yet they're here and they're bringing to the table trying to figure out solutions that we can get to to where maybe some of that doesn't happen and we're looking at those types of things across the county it's it's not just one place we are not the federal government you pay your taxes you hold us accountable if we were ma'am if we were as bad as you say we are managing our money we would have had to come a long time ago and ask for ballot for Tabor relief. We would have had to do that 20 years ago. But the fact that we're one of the last two counties, 64 counties in Colorado, and only last year did we ask for relief from Tabor, that tells you that your county has been responsible. I've been here for three years. I can attest what I've got while I've been here, but the evidence doesn't point to the misuse. The evidence points towards your government has, make it, has been making the formula work for as long as possible. And I, I think that's great credit to the men and women that live in this community. They pay the same taxes. You know what, we don't only live in Washington, D.C. The decisions and the crap that's going on there, that belongs in Washington, D.C. That is not what the men and women here are doing for you. It's just not. So I'm here to try to get to some real answers to some real problems because what we have to do with the local government, we don't borrow trillions of dollars to fix our problems and print money. I don't do that. We, we, we balance the budget every year. So ma'am, we don't make a balance, a budget if we, if, and we, because we've been using our savings account in order to try to keep the savings or the, the services at the same level that you come to enjoy love, when you're at the bare bottom of that savings, you can't go any deeper in that because what do you do if there is a wildfire? What if you do, you, you guys would be really upset with us if we had a, a cyber attack or we had a wildfire and we didn't have two months operating expense to provide those emergency services that need to be provided in the event of emergency. We're here. The primary purpose for government and local government in particular is the safety and security of the people. That's our primary directive. The rest of this stuff that goes beyond that that's why men and women, that's why you have Tabor in effect. You don't want it to grow beyond that. That's what the history of this state and what you said, is you don't want government to be bigger than what it needs to be, which means there's a lot of things that government's doing that other organizations must, should, and must do. But unless we push it over to them and get them to do it, or there's a vacancy or a vacuum, it's not going to happen. Sure. So if I'm hearing you correctly, Tabor has limited us, correct? So yes. if we decide to get the tractor pulls, we decide to get all these entities in here to make some money, it goes into the general fund. It, we can't. Is there any way we can inclusive, make it inclusive to the fairgrounds itself? And no, it doesn't go into the general fund. It goes into the revenue because there's a cap on the revenue. Any more that we make over that, we got to turn right back around and give it back to the to the taxpayers. Specifically to can we specifically to our 1.8 or can we do that? So. To where we can be accountable for our own money and we can make this work and not depend on everything else? So so here's this is a pot. <laughs> <laughs> this is a pot. It's a good pot. I'm, nobody, I'm, I'm, not, I'm a fan of keeping government limited, okay? When you put the property tax, 70% of this pot gets filled with property tax. So when you talk about generating revenue and businesses and stuff, none of that money comes to the county. We don't we don't survive on sales tax. Open space does. But we don't. We survive on um, property tax. One of the comments last year, I, I told you last week, that only 24 cents on your property tax dollar to your house that you pay taxes on comes to pay to the county for the sheriff and all the other stuff. The rest of that 76 cents or so goes to the school system, more than 50% 50, 50 of that. And then you've got special districts and some other stuff. We used to have 26 cents of that dollar. But while everybody else has been going to the ballot and increasing there, your county has not been asking you for money until last year. And you said no, which is fine. So our 26% of that dollar has gone down to 24 cents on that dollar. That's what's coming to the county. So 70% of this, and then we get state grants, highway user, the gas tax that you all pay. You're like, where's that money go? Whatever. Well, guess what? Once we get to here, the, the, this pours out. You can't go any higher than here. This all goes back, and it goes back to the taxpayers that paid the 70%. It looks so like we're a black limited. hole on the ballot. What's that? It, the way it was proposed on the ballot, it looked like a black hole. Mm -hmm. you're, you're right, but you know what? I, tell me there's an easier way to... I mean, I know I'm putting in a coffee pot. Yeah. This is not an easy thing to explain. It should say something that 62 counties have moved away from it because of it. they couldn't make it work. 
I'm with We're, you on that. And, and you know, I, so I, I mean, I don't, I don't. This is not, a, but this is part of the education. But if money comes down, if you've paid into the state, and we're at our limit, and the state comes down and says, hey, here's $2 million for highway user tax fund. Well, thank you, sir, but we can't use it. Don't give it to us because we, we, can't, we can't spend it, so keep it. And then they find some other county in the state to say, here you go, you spend it. And so that's kind of what we're up against. And, and this money, you'll see we have, there's people, I see comments online that talk about how you went from 500 and some odd million dollars up to $600 million. Your budget is growing. The only part that is, the, the, the general fund is only $217 million of that. The rest of it is funds that are like open space. Can't spend it on anything but other open space. The library fund, just the library. The federal dollars that come down to uh, provide for uh, food assistance or those types of activities, that money can't be used anywhere else from what it's sent down for. So it's already two-thirds of our budget is earmarked. So yes, does that budget part of the budget go up and affect the total bottom line? Absolutely, it does. But... It doesn't help us in this situation because it's not general fund. I, I hope that I hope I'm helping you guys understand this, and I, I I wish there was another way to explain this. What you're describing though is part of the problem, and the reason one of the major reasons why we're in this situation. That doesn't mean that the funding has to stay this way, or that the foundational um, assets that are set up and the structure for five and C3 does not have to be dictated on this. What we should have been notified, we should have been given notice, we have a problem. What are we going to do about it? Instead, what we got the notice of, hey, you know, the fairgrounds are probably going to move somewhere else or they're going to go away. So that's why this discrepancy and why we're upset and this is untenable. This is why we're sitting where we're sitting. But that, the question that you asked, can it be restructured dif differently? Absolutely. And I'm here to not... Uh, my friends, so I'm, not gonna say it. I'm not gonna whine and complain about this. This is just reality. It's the right. strength of it. But I think this solution, to your point, is a way to get around. And it's these types of solutions that we've worked on over the years that's actually helped us not have to ask the taxpayers for relief. So I do think that's there, but it means that there's gotta be some give and take. And I'm here to talk about some of that give and take. And so while I know all the fairgrounds are important, I want to know what's most important. That, that's really what I, I heard Caden say, the arena. The upper portion of the fairgrounds, is, is, is that considered, is that the, is that the premier, if, the, if I was to ask you where the promised land is, on this diagram, where is it? Because it's not all Jerusalem. What's part of it, what's part of it is, is the promised land. You can give it to Chris. Wait a second. Bill, did you have something to say or did you just hold it? Well, Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Primarily a question, really, uh, help my understanding here. Uh, looking at the fairgrounds budget, 72% of it is either personnel costs or interdepartmental charges. Right. About, about 500000 of direct costs. Mm -hmm. From what I understand, the fairgrounds generates 500000 plus or minus, of revenues, and apparently you have found, through the the work that you've done, some way of getting it up to, to close to 900,000, is that correct? 50 percent? Whatever 57 percent is. Yeah. So it seems to me that if we give up 500 to 900,000 dollars of revenue and we're only taking away 200,000 dollars of direct costs, the only way that this saves the county any money is to lay off every employee. Because the intergovernmental charges aren't going to go away, they're just going to go to another department. Is that correct? Yeah, that's a good assessment, yeah. So it's, it seems to me if we can get this net number down to something that is viable, uh, that the public thinks that 
two or three hundred thousand dollars or whatever the net number happens to be without those intergovernmental charges maybe our personnel costs could be cut a little bit I don't know sorry ladies um, but if we can work on that budget and build up that revenue number then we've got an asset here that is costing us very little and is worth in terms of the community use a huge amount okay I appreciate that comment and that's what we talked that's what we looked at for the enterprise piece if, if we can get to 90% cost recovering then it helps us all around the board the, the conversation I was having there we the teapot the revenue actually hurts mm -hmm. the revenue is not it's, it's not a revenue problem it's a total expense problem period so so the open space solution actually helps us address that and take that piece off so I really think this this is kind of the problem this this is this is a, a very good answer for the future but it, it it comes down to what to what extent and to what what piece I I can tell you that purchasing the entire fairgrounds and putting that entire fairgrounds on the open space I, I, there's I can't go back to the board with that answer I, I can't I think you need to go back to the board and say we need time to plan it Instead of asking us what the priorities are to chop this up, we've just been hit with this. We've been blindsided. And this is an asset. It's a historical asset. And we haven't had the ability to look at what even what the Colorado State grants are doing. Okay, so let me, let me clear up some. There's some misconceptions out here that I'm going to clear up. It's been said that the committee didn't understand or know what kind of constraints that we're on. We've been hot since I've been here. We've been talking about, and Jeff just said it, we've been talking about the challenges out of the fairgrounds for the fair, for cost recovery, and things like that. So this is not a new conversation. Closing the fairgrounds is an extreme solution. That's absolutely new. I lived here and I didn't know, so... Well, then you would... Yes, ma'am, but part of what we have the committee for is not to just provide advice to the board, but to interact with the community and this group to share with you what's going on and the ideas that's going on. Sir, so, you have hands up all over the room, and she keeps speaking out, and I think everybody else should get a chance to. Yes, ma'am, okay. Just you know. All right, so to finish up that question, and I'll, I'll, I'll move to some other folks. Um, so this is not a new issue. I mean, if we say that it is, then we're burying our head in the sand. And I, I can tell you that it's not a new issue. It's something that we've been talking about. When I applied for the job, I saw the train wreck that was coming, mm -hmm. that we needed to do something to address this. Well, we've been avoiding it. Nobody wanted to go to the ballot to ask people the question. They finally did, but it was, like you said, sir, it wasn't necessarily clear. It looked like a black hole. It smelled like a black hole. It must be a black hole. Um, and there's no way to easily Tabor. explain that. And yes, sir. So, ma'am, you haven't asked a question. Um, you asked what's important to keep. Yes. I think all the arenas to okay. ride in are. Okay. Because uh, I drive all the way from Evergreen, and even though they have a roadie arena, they don't allow us to ride in it openly, so I think those are okay. my <coughs> important Okay, aspects. thank you, ma'am. I appreciate that. Yes, ma'am. I have a question on the open space. Um, I am part of 4-H, and for a lot of people who are in this room, we do have fair every year, and there are a good chunk of you that could come in and buy animals from these 4-H youth that work really hard. And my question is, you said that under open space, it would be non-profit. So would the 4-H still fall underneath that, or high school rodeo, they still have to turn a profit to be able to continue to have their rodeos, or our kids with 4-H, they sell their animals at fair. Is that something we could still have the ability to do? I think, if I understand it correctly, you run that as part of a nonprofit, do you not? Yes and no. I know there are transactions that happen outside of that, but I just wanted to make sure that's realistically a profit transaction. It's something we'll need to delve into. But I assume Parks and Rec, they charge fees for their soccer, and we have soccer programs that operate on there. I don't see the, the numbers that you're talking about stay in the program. They're not going to pay uh, stockholders or you know, anything like that. So I, 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 I know you'd have to look at it more time. Well, can I can speak to that a little bit, Christy? The auction is a non-profit. J-Leak is a non-profit. So our auction does run underneath a non-profit charter. Okay. I just want to be very clear and transparent about this. We do have 
commercial operations that operate on open space properties. We charge them fees to do so. Um, we have regulations around that. They're generally recreation uses, but we have photographers that take family pictures and so forth. They all pay a fee to be able to do that on open space lands. Okay. Yes, ma'am. So, I think another priority would be the livestock barns, barn one and barn two, because those were recently turned into the poultry and rabbit barns, and those are very useful for all of livestock and horse farms, because that's where we hold some of our events during family weather. Okay, is, it, is that all year long, or is it just during the sale? It's during it's all year long as well. Okay. The other part that goes along with that in the livestock barns is if we're looking back up at the evacuation situation, possible evacuation, that's a vital part of being prepared to handle an evacuation. True, but we have, um, so... Where would you go? Where would you go different? We would contract and work on it. So there would be, um, uh, one possible example would be um, to reserve some space somewhere in open space inventory or somewhere else in the county for just such an emergency. So um, that, that's something that does not have to be owned and operated all year long for an emergency. We just have to have a contract in place uh, with an organization or with um, land in the county to take care of that should that happen. And that could be here. It could be here, it could be keep it here, or it could be somewhere else. So that's, that's not something that can only be done here. That's something that can be arranged anywhere in the county. One of the things that, that strikes me, and I, and I understand and I, I appreciate the ideas that are coming out, but we're talking about, you know, that some place will we'll find some place to take care of this and find some place to take care of that. In fact, what we're doing is not reducing the budget in the county, we're just moving it to another area. Um, no, um, because we have to maintain those buildings right now. That costs something right well, now. I understand that. If we put a contract in, so as a base commander, Mm -hmm. uh, when I was in Georgia, we had arrangements so that if there was a major hurricane that came, we had contracts in place that already had everything set up for emergency operations. We didn't spend a dime unless we needed to use that contract, and then we hit play on the contract. So otherwise, there was no expenses the rest of the year. It just sat there idle. Mm -hmm. So that's a potential to set up contracts for emergency services or emergency land or access that we could set up in the, in the county. So that that doesn't that means you're not spending money all year like the five hundred thousand dollars that's being spent on the maintenance of these buildings and the grounds. That that's not there. Just for a point, the maintenance on the grounds we tried to address in our budget reduction analysis, and that was not, not taken right. into so, account in the budget. But, uh, you know what? Why you brought that up? Let's talk about the hundred thousand dollars that's in question. So, Dexter, would you like to explain the breakdown of that hundred thousand dollars? How much went towards? Um, ground maintenance, like cutting the grass, uh, $20,000, which is being referred to. Is it the $20,000? $60,000. $60,000 for the grounds maintenance. Is that the slush fund that you're talking about? No. So the slush fund that you're talking about is what? The $20,000, right? But we have it in case we need it, and we can spend it somewhere else. And, and we've heard that multiple times throughout the budget process, um, which really concerns me. And um, the other part was the 60,000 grounds maintenance. The other part of it was about $30,000 um, in the uh, uh, improvements upstairs um, that were done and paid for the previous year, and yet they were rolled over into this year's budget. Um, so, so, so this year's budget included about thirty thousand dollars, if I remember correctly, that was actually in improvements done upstairs to the other two rooms, and it was actually paid for last year, but it was still rolled over to to, to be an expense for this year. Sorry, Mark, I'm trying to, to understand it because I wasn't there for any of that, so I can't speak to it, so I apologize. Um, I would be concerned if someone told me that they don't know what something goes to as well in the budget. That's obviously not true and accurate from how we operate at all. Um, there is $60,000 allocated in the Fairgrounds budget annually for lawn maintenance and care. 
Um, you're correct in that, yes. Yeah, and we discussed that and asked at that time whether the staff, the existing staff, if we did, it had the equipment on hand and whether the staff could handle that. And the answer was yes. And, and, so, and, and in addition to that, their answer was it would take one employee two days a week to do the grounds maintenance. And so so instead of paying out $60,000 for a, a maintenance budget, we would have needed one employee two days a week to do the same thing that we were already paying. Um, and, and that was one of the items that we found that in the $100,000 of, of, of budget that we made right here. Sure, and, I, and I'm aware of that recommendation that you all made for sure. And I know that that um, contract's been in place for a few years, and it was put in place for a few years so that the staff that was dedicated eight hours a day mowing the grounds and everything here, doing the lawn maintenance and everything else, could take a step back and spend more time focusing on customer service, and the conversions that they were having trouble with, and limiting, and limiting and eliminating the overtime that they were incurring on that as well. To run so, the events. To run the events and everything, everything else, correct. So, uh, so I, got, I don't want to turn this into We've got business people working on the business model. They're not intentionally looking for losses, and we don't have, if there's a slush fund, tell me where it's going, sir. We, we, if there's money that's not spent, like in a particular line item out here, it goes to something else that it needs to out here. It's not going, it's, I don't know, I mean, I appreciate the comment, it's not productive, but it's, I will tell you that we're not, we don't have slush fund that's going to fund somebody's pocket or do something like that. For the most part, sir, I, you had your chance, we offered you the opportunity to lead this discussion and you turned it down because you said it wasn't your job. So I'm here doing this because you chose and not that, to. Ma'am. Can I move back to a possible solution? I'm sorry? Can I move back to a possible solution? Yes, please. I think going to open space is a fantastic idea for the things that fit. Would the county consider allowing a foundation in order to attempt to keep the fairgrounds in its entirety to lease or rent or however that arrangement goes the buildings that remain with the general fund. What would you need from a foundation in good faith to say you would let it give it a try while open space preserves the lands that fit within their charter to move forward in the future if it didn't work? And could that open space foundation do and could the And could the foundation, like Boulder County, could it operate in both arenas? Could it operate on open space land and on general fund land to run their project and rent out space to the tractor pull and do whatever they needed to, grant right and sponsorship, could that happen? And what would the county need in good faith to give it a try? So um, let me take a swing at this. Uh, first of all, your last question, the answer to that is yes. That could occur in the, the county could enter in an agreement with an organization theoretically proposing a nonprofit that could operate both on, on uh, county general fund property and open space property. Uh, that actually occurs at Dinosaur Ridge. Uh, the road right-of-way is in the general fund, it's part of the road right-of-way, and then there's the visitor center itself is on the space. So there's an example for you right here in the county. Um, in terms of um, what we need is, is just looking at a business model, looking at a pro forma, because uh, we want to we make sure that if we're going to pursue this activity, that it has a good chance of being successful. Sure. You know, we don't want to, and, and frankly, the Beaver Ranch model that I talked about earlier uh, from the get-go, uh, we didn't do that kind of analysis back in the day, it was before my time, and, and it's like we set them out to manage 450 acres of land with no revenue source. So those are the kinds of things I think we need to, we need to look at. So Just to make sure that we're setting it out on a successful path. So, sir, you've had your hand up patiently. Yeah, thanks. I'm wondering the other piece might be that we were to invite the extension or the university to begin to utilize some of this property that can't go to open space, either for classes or veterinary clinics or something of that nature. They're, they're actually already doing that. Um, Jackie Payne's here. You could visit with her afterwards and she could give you many examples. I'm sorry. 
couldn't hear you. Uh, they're actually doing that right now. I just wanted to clar clarify one thing about CSU Extension. CSU Extension is a partnership between Colorado State University, my alma mater, and, and Jefferson County. And about it's about a 50-50% 50-50 partnership. The university pays a little bit more than 50% of the cost, and the county pays 48-49% of the cost. Is that about right? Yeah. Um, so, uh, and the county's portion of CSU extension is in the general fund because much of what they do is education oriented, great stuff, but it doesn't fit the open space enabling resolution. So. CSU is not in the open space fund. <coughs> a couple more questions. I'm very respectful of everybody's time. I know the other night we were here till midnight. Um, I think we said we would end at 7.30. Sir, sure, right here. Um, you know, the whole idea of open space, the county already, already owns this property. So there's, I, don't, I don't see that open space is an answer to the problem. I mean, open space funds are supposed to purchase other land, private land that people want to sell so that we can create open space parks, all that. I just don't see that whole idea of open space doing a lot here. They don't want all the expense of the buildings and all the upkeeps of that. It's not really what open space program is geared to do. So you got to find a different way, even if it's something private. If you sell these buildings and somebody wants to run it as a commercial enterprise, they can do that. They can lease the ground from the county. The county already owns the land. So other than shifting where you're going to get money to run it from is all you're asking open space to do. And they Agreed. should be buying right. land. So one of the advantages, again, of the difference between open space and general fund is the Tabor restrictions. So that's, that's part of that benefit. Um, Tom, I don't know. I mean, you, you're right. We own it either way. But one, we're subject to the teapot limits that I was showing you. On the other, we're not. And so, but if you look at the charter or whatever for open space, the, you know, if somebody up in Evergreen or somewhere in a place that's not developed in this county right. wants to sell that, that's what those funds are geared for. And to maintain those parks and the staff that <coughs> controls those parks and everything else. So that's where that needs to go. So we need to okay. get out from under table. Ma'am. Yeah. I guess I have a question. Yeah applies to you and also to Dexter. If we take the white spot, the white uh -huh. section, we make it turn into elephant space, <coughs> how much money does that take off your operating budget to allow the brown section to become an enterprise and to be a self-sustaining entity? Does that lessen and make it so that we could still, you could still function and run an event center if we took, if the top section was taken out of your, your, your Area of responsibility, I guess. And just to be clear what space you're talking about, you're talking about the upper level. Yeah, we'll take, we'll take the white level, make it open space, we do the brown stuff. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and does that um, increase the, upper, the chance to become an enterprise fund? Right, That's does that make asking. it a better chance to be an enterprise fund? Would you, from the three years that you've been doing this, would, could you be self-sustaining in the brown section? If this part is the 200000 part, the rest of it is $1.6 million. We generated $500,000 in revenue, so it doesn't, it doesn't get us to the $1.6 million. Is that kind of sum up? Yes, sir. Hey, Donna, I just want to, um, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm good. I just want to add also, you're just trying to make a list of what the important structures are. I am. Especially if we go an open space solution. And, uh, in adding to what that young lady said about the livestock barns, I just want to point out that those are also vital structures to support any rodeos that we put on on the property because we fill those, uh, like all the livestock barns with, uh, pens that people then pay. They rent out, uh, so that they can keep the horses there so their livestock's not in trailers. For three or four days. <laughs> so that's, those are uh, very, those are vital support structures. Or, or you change on the ability for equine to be able to tie out and build their own pens or become self sustainable in the radio. So the limit, limitation for us right now 
is that our clients typically travel to these outer communities with, you know, extreme motorhomes, those type of things, to be able to afford that, they're allowed to pen at their trailer. In this case, we have no ability, which is actually my question at hand. So, if I valued Dexter wherever you are, hi, um, 22000 was what you valued the facility for me to rent for my rodeo, and then you discount it as a flat rate that we pay $10,000, no matter how we do it. So I asked for a 5% on things we weren't going to use, and the value came down to 7 if we went to open space, or set the value now? Because it's still not a price point that's affordable to a It would be the foundation that, or the organization that ends up running it. They could get sponsorship. There's things that they could get. So back to your point, sir, if it's not open space and that organization is running it, the state grants and the revenues that they apply don't fall underneath Tabor. Right now, you can talk about having that organization. If it's underneath the general fund and, she, and, and Lisa gets a state grant, it counts against Tabor. So we, we may not even be able to approve the application for the grant because it'll put us over the limit. Here's one little plea here. You guys are talking about 21, I'm still talking about 20. Because I'm bankrupt after 20. And here's why. What's why is volunteerism not a welcome part of this community at this point? So we build tents, we reduce our cost, we kick up the manure, we move it. How come at a nonprofit level, the margin went from 22 to 17, but the dollar amount still the same out? It doesn't matter which way you shift. Well, that doesn't help the nonprofit, right? Because we're not for profit, but we're bankrupt after this rodeo by the fact that. Last year we could volunteer our service, correct? Yes. Yep. This year safety and committee has said no. It's a difference of five thousand dollars. You're at why not community service those prisoners? <laughs> could they not reduce the staff time? I know in other counties and other municipalities, volunteers provide a service in the upwards of two hundred thousand dollars. And um, and that's pretty much how Western Airs runs their property. Now, I'm asking for the same relationship today not 21 not 22 but today I was told that yep. yep it's the difference of me being a business to be here in 21 though right so last year when we met we chatted back in May what your rate would be for 2020 Understood. it was something that we all met as a group and agreed on because like we chatted with many of our clients the management that was here before did not hold people in compliance. And so that's where we're trying to get all of our clients so that everyone is on a level playing field. So to attract business, Brittany, what, why can we come down to 17 when we're at 22 but it doesn't shift? So there's no price point that stays stable. Do you see that? Yes. But the when price point's not stable, so you can't attract more business. It is stable, but when you're getting a $7,000 discount, your fee is going to stay the same no matter what you take off until it gets below that $10,000 mark. So the volunteerism to keep me in business to be here next year is not on the table. I asked that today. Yes. So, like we chatted when we met today, even last year there was a cap on those volunteer hours because we still have to cover our hard costs, which we're not doing currently with that event. And we're trying to work with you to make it happen. You are. I agree. I agree you are working with us. The message isn't the same. It's, it's a non-profit agency that will be out there. And, and that goes back to our problem of not giving everything away. We've got organizations like the sheriffs using the space upstairs. There was a time when they, they, we didn't, they, they, didn't, they didn't pay for that. But you, you can't give everything away to everyone um, for, so that's part of it. So when folks say, well, decrease the charges so that people can come, the charges that we're charging now are meant to recover the cost. If we go lower, then we're, we're not helping the ultimate problem I've got. So let me, let me kind of maybe hopefully wrap. Is there a, what are some of the other primary needs for success? I've got written up here the arenas, the livestock farms, and the event center. And besides the whole fairground, what else, what other sacred ground is up here? Sir? You need shop, in my opinion, to support the uh, 
arenas maintenance maintenance and staff okay okay I'm sorry what was that other one <coughs> the what the equipment stop okay Okay, and I think that would be part of, like Western Airs, they built their building, they store their stuff, they bought their equipment. So that's part, that long-term solution would be, you see what I'm saying? So I'm trying to identify where we get, what, what, what's important to the group that we can get to, and then part, the other part of that, the details will have to be worked out in long-term. I think if we have a long-term vision to get to some place that's longer-term, we can take actions in the short-term to get us there. Right? It's, maybe it's not full turkey in 2021. It's a process that happens over a couple of years. Okay. Okay. Yes, ma'am. I'm sorry. Oh my God. <laughs> it's not easy. It's a rowdy bunch. I've been where you're at. It's okay. Yes. So, as to what we need, maybe some of the 4-H people can help more than I can, but I'm a 4-H parent. And we have equipment that is stored here on the fairgrounds in our own storage facilities. Where does that go? And then, oh, about an hour and a half ago, I wanted to address Lisa's, <coughs> when she first commented, I think this is brilliant. Thank you. <laughs> but you were talking about creating a nonprofit. So, I've been in that business. I've been an executive director. I've created one from the ground up. It's not easy. And to get it done by November is almost next to impossible. So my suggestion, I'm not offering my services. My suggestion, <laughs> my suggestion is you find a nonprofit that closely resembles our goals and you work under an umbrella of them. And that's how I functioned as an executive director for many years, working under an umbrella of an already existing foundation that's willing to take you under. And then when you're willing to go out on your own, you need to hire an executive director with the stipulation that the only way they get paid is that they find their own grants for their own salary. It works. I've done it. It, it works. There, there's, there's maybe a local model that I think um, that I've been thinking about that more other people know more about than I did, but the purchase of the Applewood Golf Course, which was through Prospect uh, Recreation, also has $3 million from GoCo, which are the great outdoors Colorado, which are lottery dollars. <laughs> we do work with GoCo. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, your comment is about... Uh, well, I'm, I'm wondering if that's a model. I don't actually know the weeds of that deal, but I have to Yeah, it. yeah. Um, I believe GoCo a, contributed about $2 million to the acquisition of an Applewood Golf Course. Uh, Great Outdoors Colorado uh, receives lottery proceeds and distributes those in the form of grants, which Applewood was. Um, we also, the county also <coughs> receives uh, lottery proceeds, part of our conservation trust fund. It's about $1.1 million a year has to be used for very specific purposes. A little bit wider scope than the open space fund in yeah. terms of what it can be used for. Yeah. But, uh, and those dollars have been used here at the fairgrounds um, for various capital improvements and eligible expenses. So you don't see it as a, as a model going forward? As a, I, I don't as a see... Resource the, uh, well, first of all, GOCO funding is extremely competitive. Yeah. Um, and, and they have funded uh, fairgrounds projects, uh, particularly in rural counties when the fairground serves as a very central community center. Um, not to say this doesn't for a certain segment of the population, but in those rural counties, it really gets amplified. So it's possible, but it's, it's, it's competitive. It's not ideal. Here we are. There you go. I guess. 
you're talking about wrapping up this evening. I think one of the questions that, that is out there is when we started this conversation a week ago, that you're going to go make a presentation to the Board of County Commissioners at a staff meeting on t next Tuesday. And in a relatively short period of time, we've, we've got a lot of stuff that, that got put on the table. Is your intention to make that, that briefing recommendation? And what's your intention about, or feel like the intention of the commissioners is, going forward on timing on making their decisions and having other public meetings and hearings before they do that? Okay, uh, so the answer to your question is I am going to add this option right here that, that we talked about this evening. Um, that's going to be my recommended course of action. Um, status quo doesn't get us there. Um, enterprise doesn't get us there. Shutting the fairgrounds down is not a good answer. So coming up with an answer that involves Tom and his staff and how we can come up with some viable solution, that will be my recommendation to the board moving forward. Um, in an effort to make sure that we uh, retain the essential services needed out here based on community input. Now, I can guarantee you that the answer won't be the entire fairgrounds. I, I'm, just, I'm just saying that right now. I don't, I'm going to be completely transparent that the, the whole fairgrounds isn't going to be. But to make sure that 90% of what you want um, is, is retained, to make sure that your kids and the, and the things that you've come to know and love out here are, are there, that would be the goal. And that would be handed off at some point. So my recommendation on Tuesday, we'll talk about the different, we'll, we'll talk about the different options, the research that we've done, uh, the numbers, and then that I think that a viable way forward that will give the board some of what they need in terms of the budget cuts, but also retain what the community wants, then this is the option that I want to recommend, that they give us a direction to continue to pursue this and work on that solution. The second part of my question, though, was, from that point, is there going to be other hearings from in front of the commissioners? Any other public input from the community? Yes. Yeah, for the most part, the way, the way Tom operates, they have community meetings. He has community input. They don't do things in isolate. You've worked with Tom, so yeah. But that's my, I, you, yes. you know, I think that the that the trigger has been, you know, are they going to make a decision on Tuesday? Yes. They will make. Oh well. It, it, not well. I'm, I'm going to recommend this solution. Do I think that they're going to make a recommendation to close the fairgrounds in entirety? No. It's a briefing. I would recommend to them if that's the course of action they want to do, hold another hearing. So now that being said, um, what's going to happen next Tuesday is uh, we have a hearing scheduled. The hearing is very short. Looks like um, there's an opportunity for public comment. So every citizen gets three minutes to provide public comment during the hearing. Um, there will be a briefing. They're going to go ahead and hold the briefing down there. Uh, that's a briefing. That'll be uh, my staff uh, presenting, our fairground staff and me presenting just the, the stuff that we've already presented to you all with the added option of this with my recommendation to pursue this course of action. Um, and that hearing would normally happen upstairs in the briefing room, but that will happen down in the hearing so that everybody that comes can stay there and listen to it. But there will be opportunity to provide comment ahead of time, and I would encourage the public to spend your three minutes to um, let the commissioners know how important the fairgrounds is to you. How much time is allocated at the beginning of that for that public comment? There's no, it, until the three minutes for, until people are done, there are three, there are three minutes per person. And so until There's everybody's no done. on time. Well, not three time. minutes, that's it, per person. I know, but 15 minutes generally is the limit. No, I mean, that's time. not the way we do public, we do public comment, we let people. Um, what the commissioners have been doing recently is at the beginning, they have two public comment periods. Right. One is at the beginning of the hearing and one is at the end of the hearing. If you have a lot of people that are there at the beginning on the same topic, <coughs> they will usually cut that to 15 minutes just so that they can get to the rest of the hearing, and then they will continue again at the end. Okay, that wasn't clear in the information that was out, so that nobody knew what was going to be available for public comment at that briefing and hearing. Okay, and typically at the beginning, the, the, the uh, comment period at the beginning, um, those folks that have to get to work or whatever, we try to limit it to those folks that really have to go that can't speak later. So. That will still be limited to that part. The hearing is so, I, I will tell you right now, the hearing schedule 
the, it should be like two minutes. So the, the comment period before and the comment period after, I think what they're, I think the plan right now is to go through the hearing, which should take about two minutes, get that done, and then go have, have public comment at the end. And then once the public comment is done, then we'll go into the briefing and then the board will give us some direction on which course of action they would like us to continue to pursue, which I suspect will be that way. And when will we, as a group, find out how that uh, you can, you'll, Right there, if you stay for the briefing, then you'll hear. I can't get off to go to it. Well, um, it, it'll also be on closed circuit TV. Okay. Not for the brief. We'll put a press release out. Mm -hmm. What time is the meeting? <clears throat> I'm sorry. What time is the meeting? The a hearing is, starts at eight o'clock, eight a.m. Tuesday. Yes, ma'am. I was just wondering, under this open space option, is there are there any downsides or <coughs> we've not yet already discussed, just so that we have a full understanding of what that would mean for our paragraphs? Well, I, Tom, what were the downsides of open? Tom will tell you that there's no downsides to open space. <laughs> uh, I think, I mean, the limitations that you spoke of. Um, uh, you know, I think part of that is, you know, the activities that it can occur. It can't just be anything. It's got to fit within their, I called it a charter, but it's an enabling resolution. <laughs> I, I wasn't sure if there's anything in addition to what we've no, There are no said. downsides. I'm sure they're, uh, you know, it can't be all upside, right? And, and, and that's something that we need to discover as we talk through the, the specifics of it. Yes, ma'am, you Sorry, just to add to the needs for success, I don't know who owns what as far as Western Airs. Obviously, I'm a little biased, but just parking for trailers, things like that, like I don't want that to be overlooked in um, a big piece of, a piece of the fairground. <laughs> I can't take away any parking because I'm not a very good parker. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't hear the whole thing. What about large animal evacuation in case of emergency? Is that up there? So it's not up there in terms for needs for success. We do know that we need to cover that, and currently that's here. If we didn't have this space, we would arrange to, we would put a contract in place that ensures we have a location for animal evacuation. It would be part of our emergency plan. So, so it would be done. It just doesn't necessarily have to be done here. It can be done anywhere. I just would. We would have to set up a contract. What's that? Where would it be? We would figure that out. Um, it could be. It could be right across. It could be. Um, it could be on a portion of open space. It could be um, uh, with a private owner who has a large barn and he's willing to give us a contract that we can execute. I mean, I. I there's, there's any number of answers. There's plenty of options across 774 square miles of Jefferson County for us to set up options to for emergency operations should we have a wildfire that requires evacuation. But we have evacuation infrastructure established right here. You send us to an open space. I've got, I don't know, 33 animals at home. Who's going to provide the pens for those? Yes, ma'am, and we would put contracts in place to handle those types of things, and we wouldn't spend any money until we actually had to execute the contract. I, I just It goes back to the $500,000 annual expense to maintain the buildings, um, so that that's each year. And so if we had an agreement in place that doesn't cost us anything, but then there's an emergency that happens and we need to execute it, and then we would execute it and spend the money then. So, um, that's done nationwide in different things. Again, as a base commander, I had millions of dollars in contracts in place. Should a hurricane or a major 100-year or 500-year flood occur um, in, in the southeast? And so we, we do those types of things all the time. All right, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to let we we'll go with five more questions or, or points, and then we're going to wrap it up. So, sir. The problem with what you're saying about having contracts and stuff for emergency situations, Again, we have the infrastructure right there. If you go to put contracts, do contracts with open space, whatever, what I got from you is an emergency happens, we have a wildfire and have a bunch of evacuations. At that point in time, we'll go to whatever open space or wherever, then we'll set up. 
by that point in time, we're already behind the eight ball. Whereas again, we have the same infrastructure set up here. The answer to the question is we would have to have an answer and that is a requirement. We do. Whether it's here, whether it's somewhere else, whether it's at a school or whatever, there are, is lots of infrastructure across the entirety of the county that becomes available in emergency that we can use that is already owned by the county. It doesn't necessarily have to be here. All right, ma'am. Through the need for success, um, this may not be, I'm also a 4-H mom, but it seems like we might need a, a support room to, um, for meetings and for uh, cold air, air conditioning, there we go, and we need uh, freezers or freezing water bottles for the rabbits because they can die in high heat. So perhaps a, a room external to the event center. Second idea, maybe um, setting up temporary tents for... Temporary Say that last part again. Maybe large tents might be helpful. Maybe that's a really bad idea uh, during the fair. Okay. And then thirdly, I don't know the history of this building we're in, this exhibit hall. Um, I've been here since 92, but I don't know the history of this and why was it built? Has it ever been um, self-supporting? Um, yes. Was it hugely successful and now it's not? I mean, what's some history? Yes. Okay, my dad was manager at Fletcher Wood. This was a very successful fairgrounds at one time. Everything started getting priced out. Everything's been contracted out. He had a staff of five people that managed this whole area, kept it up and clean, and they mowed the fields. They did the cleaning while there were events going on around. They came in. They didn't get brand new equipment. He worked hard to get any bit of equipment that came onto this fairgrounds. And there's a bunch in this room that can testify to that on a part. They have turned it around to where new equipment, new equipment, hire this out, hire that out. That can be why our budget is out of luck. My question is, open space, if we did the open space thing, I think it's a great idea, but it has limitations. If you had a nonprofit in place, could you contract with the county directly with that nonprofit and keep it intact so we could do the whole myriad of everything instead of being specific to what fits here and here. We could, but then all those revenues and expenses all fall underneath the general fund. But if you lease the property to the nonprofit for 100 bucks a year, then your Tabor was $100 a year. We could, and I, I, that previous meeting that we had last week, I asked if anybody knew someone with those types of resources that would be willing to step up and do exactly that. That, that will cost, that, that we, whoever that is, is going to have to have the money to run the fairgrounds however they see fit. If it's not 1.8 and they can do it for 1.2, they still got to come up with 1.2, whatever that number is. So I just want to point out a little nuance there. Okay. So if, if that scenario that you talked about, you create a nonprofit, the county leases it for a nonprofit, the county continues to maintain the buildings and the nonprofit is paying the county the expenses to do that counts against our Tabor County. We got to get out from under Tabor for this place. Yeah. Go back to the voters. I, I don't I disagree. I, I, uh, but that, that and that question has been asked. I think they'll go back at some point. That question will get asked again. And you all have a chance to make an impact on that. You know, I mean, I do think that the line item, uh, itemized uh, the line item, but if, if, if you want to retain the entire fairgrounds, if that's the option that you want to go with, yes. then my recommendation to the board is they put a ballot initiative on there to mm -hmm. just do the fairgrounds, but then if the answer is no, then the fairgrounds get shut down. So I, 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 I don't, I personally, and I haven't grown up here and lived here my whole life, but my observation and having lived in lots of different places of the country, in the country, I don't think that this group, as much as you feel passionate about it, I don't think there are 570,000 citizens here all feel the same way. And that's a sad, that's a sad thing, but I think that's the reality. But, but that's certainly, if, if there was enough push from this group, that you wanted all or nothing, then 
the, the only answer for all or nothing would be a ballot initiative. Okay, one more question. Who's it going to be? Yes, ma'am. So when you're talking about your proposal for your open space, you keep you keep listing extra things that the fairgrounds are currently doing. What is your proposal going to be? What do you, what on that list there are you proposing to knock off so it doesn't have to go to a ballot of all of nothing? Yeah. My, my basic recommendation, because Thomas said the devil's in the details, my basic recommendation would be that the, the that status quo is not the choice, enterprise is not a choice, closing the fairgrounds is not a choice that I'm recommending, considering open space solution. That's the answer that I want to do. And then I hand it off to Tom and his team. We'll work with the community and, and work with uh, figuring out what is and what isn't, and so then they would not, come back. So you're not suggesting only the upper portion, or only the bottom uh, portion? Not, not, to, not on not Tuesday, no, not at all. That's, that's, way, that's a much more detail. Part of it was to get some feedback from you all, <coughs> but no, I'm, that, that's, that's much, I'm, we're not prepared to talk about that level of detail. That would have to be worked out. Um, in terms of what could and couldn't be done. And then there's going to be, then at some point um, within the next, you know, six months or so, whatever that time frame would be, I would expect that Tom would uh, put together a package uh, based on his interaction and his best recommendation that would help us stick to some of the priorities. Um, it, will it be an answer that everybody likes? No. Nope. Will it be an answer that you hopefully can mostly like? I hope so. Um, I think it's a lot better than closing or the other options. Just, it just is. So, um, ma'am, one last. Go ahead. I'll I'll stop it. Just to clarify things. Nobody, not everybody will be satisfied with what you're suggesting. <coughs> no, you'll have happy people, you'll have upset people. Mm -hmm. The thing of it is, is number one, we need communication. Mm -hmm. It's, to me, the biggest a asset that we have missed here for this yeah. area is no communication. Okay, and I'll, I've, there's the, the committee is here, and so I'm sure that they'll take that up for action, and how can the Fairground Advisory Committee work more? I, I know, ma'am, I, I appreciate that the part of what the Fairground, the board has a committee. They have over 30 committees across the county that they use as a conduit to interact with the public. They are volunteers and they are members of the public that serve on that board to provide advice based on the input that they get from the community and from the people that use the activities they do. So I absolutely think that the Fairgrounds Advisory Committee, how can they, they have meetings once a month. Those are open meetings. People that are interested, I, there's, there's 125 people been here last two meetings. They would love if that many people showed up to their, every one of their meetings. They'd be, it'd be a late night. <laughs> so I better not waste some on there. But, they, that, all your voices would be heard and they would get a chance to interact and, and address those and then turn around to the BCC and share with them advice that's based on, um, I think the board probably doesn't know a lot of you people. I, I know Mark said that the other day. He doesn't know most of the people that are in room. And these were people that have said the fairgrounds are a very significant part of their lives. And if we got the fairground and board advisory committee or members don't know who you are, that's what, we need to fix that too. That's, That's how where we... I'm saying communication. Yes, ma'am. So I think that. All right, so last question. Okay. Uh, from what I understood, it's uh, maybe not feasible to uh, keep the fairgrounds in its entirety, whichever mm -hmm. model we go with. Is there anything that can be done that the part that doesn't stay will still fit the character of the place? Or are we going to see a, a strip mall, a high rise, another car dealership? Or... Right. Um, I don't know that the property is actually zoned for any of that. So, I mean, if you're, you're talking about if we actually sold the property like, for yeah, private like development. If the RV part and, and the playground and that grassy area where to go, but what would that look like? How do you envision that? I, right now, I, I'm, I'm trying to preserve and address this, this issue. I don't, right now, that's a county asset. And the county, I'm not, I'm not promoting a... Let's sell it, and it, whatever happens, happens. I don't know what the answer would be. Once we get an answer on this, and we see what's left, then we can talk about what's left. I think there's too many, um, I think the value of the property is mostly still to the county. I think that as, um, as, as for example, if um, we needed to consolidate offices between Golden and Lakewood, 
for the DMV and for the clerk and recorder, would this location be a good location for that? We own the property, we have the buildings. That would be a viable repurposing for some of the buildings here. We've got the parking. Um, it's a central location between Lakewood and Golden, and it makes, means we go from two locations down to one location, and it creates some space in the courthouse. We had to build another courthouse. That's part of why we had to do And we've got a second courthouse that we need to build in the next 10 years. A courtroom, I'm sorry, not a courthouse. We've already got one courthouse. We don't need another. No, we have a very big courthouse, right? Um, so we need another courtroom, and that's something else. And that requires us to, we got to make enough space to make a courtroom, and that requires us to shuffle all the other tenants to move around. And, and clerk and recorder, uh, their election equipment, and um, their DMV and licensing and those types of things, that might need another. This could be a location for that. So, But there's all sorts of possibilities. Um, that's just one. Uh, we won't, until we figured out or until we saw what Tom, Tom and the team came up with the community, um, would we be able to see what's left and then what. But it, I can guarantee you it's going to be thoughtful. It's not going to be knee-jerk reaction. The, the goal is to maximize what the county currently has. Okay. Uh, so as a wrap-up, um, I'm going to give a brief um, on Tuesday um, at, at 8 o'clock to the board. You're all invited. Where? You, uh, Where? At the county courthouse in hearing room one. Okay. Um, you'll get three minutes uh, if you want to speak during public comment. It'll be clear that that will be the only time. There won't be other time to talk during the briefing. That's a briefing. It's a one-way conversation from me to the board. The board will ask me questions. So um, if you've got something to say about the fairgrounds, I would encourage you to be there for public comment um, to use your three minutes. Uh, to tell them why you think the fair, fairgrounds is important and what part of the fairgrounds is important. I think they're going to they're gonna be interested in that too. Okay? Um, I really appreciate everybody's uh, patience. Um, I hope uh, I'm, that the, I appreciate the conversation uh, remaining respectful and I, th I think you all understand that the challenge I have and I also understand the passion and, and the desire and, and folks, I can guarantee you nobody's lining up in my office to tell me how they can save and contribute to twelve and a half million dollars. Nobody. <laughs> the sheriff's not lining up, public health is not lining up, the DA, nobody is lining up to tell Don Davis how they can contribute to twelve and a half million dollars. So it is every 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 dollar is this kind of reaction, and that's what we're that's what we're working towards, and uh, we'll continue to do that. So I appreciate y'all's patience and attendance here tonight. Uh, be safe driving home, and um, thank you very much for your support and your attendance.